Hello again and welcome to lecture number nine uh, on the thermodynamics module. Uh, today we're going to look at heat engines um, uh, and gradually talk, introduce the concept and the property entropy. Um, this far we've uh, looked at the zero floor where we introduced temperature. Uh, we've not yet defined the Kelvin scale but we'll, we'll mention that uh, very soon. Uh, we also looked at the first law, where we managed to introduce the uh, uh, property energy uh, in kilojoules. Uh, that's the units we're using for energy. Uh, and now I'm going to start to get on to the second law, which introduced another property called entropy. Um, well, um, as far as the um, as uh, the zero flaw and the first law are concerned. I did mention that there is a sort of microscopic view of the world. Uh, temperature uh, is, is saying something about the distribution uh, of the energy levels uh, that are taking place uh, at the microscopic level. Uh, molecules are taking up particular energy levels and the temperature tells you uh, uh, some information about that. It also thought about, uh, in a sense, then reflecting the sort of activity um, that's going on. Uh, with molecules, what energies they're, they're, they're taking, uh, or what velocities, uh, uh, the distribution of those velocities uh, that are taken at the microscopic level. So temperature is, is, is saying something about that. Uh, energy we sort of link to, um, well, energy we link to the microscopic energies, or mechanical energies, if you like, uh, not just mechanical, uh, certainly kinetic energies of particles. Have a possible potential energy as well, and that's uh, essentially le electromagnetic. You know, these are electric fields, electromagnetic fields, and there's traction and, and repulsion going on with particles. Uh, so that aspect uh, is uh, being captured by potential energies between particles. Um, but essentially, for us, we're kind of thinking about it in mechanical terms uh, as mechanical energies, versus kinetic energies. So, uh, uh, but of course, we found a way to, in the classical thermodynamics, to define these things without necessarily referring to these microscopic descriptions. I don't think it does any harm, though, to understand where these things are coming from. It's quite useful, just a, as a mental tool, to understand what energy is about or what temperature is about. Um, so we found with the, the zero flow, for instance, using thermal equilibrium, uh, we could find uh, what temperature was, that the system had a property, um, and we uh, were able to use thermal equilibrium to, uh, to define that property, to give it its name. We also found when we were looking at the first law, um, we were able to define energy uh, in a sort of macroscopic way, about going to the, the micro, microscopic world we were able to say by observation, it was all experimental, both of these laws, essentially experimental observations. We were able to look at um, uh, a cycle, a system going on a cycle. And we observed that when that happens, that the algebraic sum of the heat transfers and the algebraic sum of the work transfers, these remember heat and work, but our energy transfers into our system, they were equal essentially, in SI units, certainly. So they turned out to be equal. And we used that to, to uh, deduce that, well, there must be a property then. Uh, there must be another property in the system. Uh, because when we went round the cycle and summed these things up, we got, um, uh, well, delta Q minus delta W, we got that to be equal to zero, didn't we? So for our first law, we had this type of statement, delta W minus delta Q. Um, and when we integrate around the cycle, of course, uh, this equation, uh, if you go around the cycle with property, uh, uh, it's zero when you integrate that. And uh, so that, that's essentially what we deduce from the, from the first law uh, from Joule's statement. Well, so that's, that's pretty good. Uh, now we want to get on to this, the second law. Um, and, to, and we're going to get to the second law um, in the classical sense, using heat engines. Uh, but I'm going to say a little bit, uh, just as an introduction, 
uh, about the microscopic world uh, as a first stab, and then I will come back to it uh, just to uh, sort of reinforce it a bit later on. Um, so what we have then uh, with the with the first law, we can see that we've got a property on the left hand side, a change of property, and on the right hand side we've got transfers. And we're going to find when it comes to uh, entropy. Uh, things are slightly different. Here, it's essentially about conservation. We know that if you look at the universe, the energy is not changing. Uh, and this, this equation is telling us that. It's saying the energy is going from one place to another. Uh, it's, going, it's transferring outside the system uh, to the system and, and so forth. Uh, but when we look at the total universe, which consists of the system and its surroundings, uh, there's actually no change in the in the total total amount of energy. Uh, so energy is, in, in a sense, it's about uh, quantity. Uh, now we're going to find some other words used for entropy, uh, and one of them is uh, quality. So there's actually four words you'll will see popping up. And let me just put these words that uh, come up when you think about uh, think about entropy. Uh, so. Well, for energy, we're thinking about quantity. For entropy, uh, uh, we're thinking about quality. Uh, so one word that we'll see is quality. So uh, when it comes to, to entropy, and you'll find this in the textbooks, that some uh, authors will talk about the quality of energy um, and relate it to uh, entropy. Um, so that's one of the words. Uh, I'll mention a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, disorder is another word. Disorder, well, this word is often used in associated with uh, entropy. Uh, disorder, this is uh, it's um, a microscopic, uh, ver uh, it comes from the microscopic version of, of entropy. As I say, all these things are underpinned by microscopic behavior. And entropy, in fact, from the microscopic view, is quite is one of the easiest to, to think about, as it turns out. Uh, temperature turns out to be a bit more tricky, uh, but uh, so we've got disorder. Uh, spo spontaneous is another word. So spontaneous change usually linked to the word natural. When we see process happen happening without intervention, uh, without work, to be precise. Um, the, we, we, these were these processes are, taught, are called spontaneous, uh, which I'll mention, um, and reversibility. Reverse is another word that we find uh, crops up um, when it comes to uh, entropy. And in fact, reversibility: uh, can you reverse a system? Can you drive it in both directions? Uh, if you're lifting a weight, can you do a slight change to the system and uh, lower the weight? Uh, so certain processes will be reversible um, and we can actually use reversibility. And this is the, in fact the route into defining entropy without looking at the microscopic world. Uh, is the, and the route we are going to look at is uh, use this idea of reversibility. Um, uh, you, there's no such thing as a reversible system, not truly, uh, and uh, it has to be done very, very slowly as well. It's a, these we've mentioned quasi-static processes; everything's in equilibrium. And so, when you think about it, if you try, try to reverse something, it has to be, you have to have equilibrium. Uh, if you do a, a, a minute change and it, it, send it, in, it sends it in the other direction, it would have to be in equilibrium in the first place before you're able to do that. So. This again, reversible processes are extremely slow processes and, and don't really happen in, in practice. So we have the word quali uh, quality uh, associated with it, and uh, what usually is defined uh, quantity. People say, okay, the quantity and energy uh, we got from the first law, and the quality we're getting from the second. Uh, and the idea is that I entropy this number as entropy goes big. Uh, uh, quality goes down. So I entropy has low quality uh, and, co uh, and conversely of course then low entropy as I quality. Um, and from my point of view I'm not a big fan of this and I'm not going to say a great deal about it 
because it, it starts to become a bit contradictory when you, when you start to think about it in any detail. Uh, but it's, it's a word essentially used to sort of uh, to, to, to try to give some meaning to what entropy is. And from my point of view, it's just another word uh, replacing entropy with a more familiar word. And hopefully that, that makes it more easy to understand. Uh, so I'm not going to say much about uh, that, but you will find it in the textbooks. I have to mention it. Uh, um, and uh, entropy turns out to be a property uh, we're going to find. And as I said, the, the law will show that. Uh, when you start to start thinking about uh, qualities of property, it starts to break down. So, uh, so I, I won't say much more about it than that. So I'm going to talk uh, the, the microscopic view then, this disorder, disorder of view. What does it mean by that? Well, Boltzmann came up with, um, with uh, a formula for what we call absolute entropy. And let me write it down because it's, it's a really nice formula. Is that S is equal to K natural log of W. So this is Boltzmann formula. It is microscopic. I'm only mentioning it in passing. Uh, we're not going to uh, do any work with this. We're not going to use it. But I mentioned in passing. Uh, just, so that's our entropy. So this is called absolute entropy. Now remember, for, for our studies, and I mentioned it with energy, quite often we're interested in the difference in things rather than and with energy and entropy as well. We're interested in the difference as we go from one state to the next. Um, and we don't tend to worry about absolute values, you know, where there's a zero and everything's positive above that uh, as when it comes to energy and also entropy. But there is absolute values. They do exist. Um, we, we, for temperature, we, 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 uh, we haven't actually defined it yet, but I'm using the Kelvin scale. It is an absolute, absolute scale. There's a zero there. Everything's above it. Um, and also for energy, there is. Uh, but it doesn't come from uh, the theory, classical thermodynamics. It comes from another theory. It comes from Einstein's theory uh, of relativity, where he's, rela where he's relating uh, energy to mass. Uh, um, and, and therefore, you can define an absolute, an absolute energy. Um, we tend not to worry about that. It's a no concern. We, man we mentioned when we used the tables, you may recall, we used the steam tables, we seem to have absolute values there, we found values for things, but that was an artificial uh, imposition. Uh, that was just for convenience, so there's no true absolute, absolute values there. Um, pressure, of course, we do have all the pressures we use in thermodynamics are absolute. We, we hopefully dispense with gauge pressure, never use gauge pressure, <laughs> never think about it on this course. It's absolute pressures that are always being used here, but because all the state equations are in terms of absolute pressures. Um, so yeah, we certainly don't fall for uh, make the mistake of using gauge pressures in any of the any of the assignment questions or any questions in the in uh, in the in the sheets. So okay, but also for entropy we have this this formula. So the key here is Boltzmann. So this is Boltzmann's formula. Uh, this is Boltzmann's equation. Um, so from Boltzmann equation, this is, uh, so Boltzmann equation is S is equal to K, very famous formula. It's, it's put on his gravestone, in fact. Uh, he did he did that uh, very young. Uh, lots of people working in the area of uh, uh, statistical mechanics and these type of things. There was uh, quite a lot of suicides involved. Uh, and in thermodynamics as well itself, uh, uh, it's uh, a lot of the ideas that people came up with took many years to be understood, uh, which is, I suppose, quite dispiriting. Anyway, so this is a famous equation. Uh, K we've met already. K is Boltzmann's constant. Um, K is equal to 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. Um, so, uh, so a very tiny number, tiny number. Uh, w, uh, not so tiny number, uh, generally a big number, uh, is called the weight of an arrangement. This is this is so this is a bit unusual. Again, let's well let's write it down. I'll give the word for it. Weight of an arrangement. Uh, 
This concept belongs to another subject altogether. It's this statistical mechanics. Uh, it's to do with uh, it's to do with uh, the possibilities. Well, when you look at uh, the microscopic world, uh, we know from quantum theory that the energies are discretized. So even if you imagine a particle moving across uh, across it, uh, moving at uh, a given velocity. Uh, it's, it's moving at uh, discrete values of velocity. It occupies discrete values. Uh, uh, quite small differences, generally dictated by this number, in fact. Uh, so as far as we're concerned, it looks continuous. Um, and the question is uh, what you can, what this thing is referring to. It's looking at the number of ways that you can arrange uh, the, the molecules in the energy levels, the number of energy levels a molecule can occupy uh, but keep the same energy, total energy of, uh, of your system. Uh, so this is a, a very, a very high number. Um, and the more energy levels it can occupy, uh, then, of course, the W goes up um, and entropy goes, goes up accordingly. So it's essentially about, um, it's, it's about, it's about uh, mixing the way uh, entropy, what entropy tends to do, it tries to, it tries to adopt states that have a maximum number of possible arrangements, uh, essentially. So this is what it's essentially doing. Um, and this formula is what they're indicating that. But again, it's, I'm just mentioning that, I just want to mention in passing, I will say a little bit more where we, where we try to not work it out, but show how, how we calculate this a bit later on. Uh, but this is the microscopic view of the world. So this is Boltzmann equation. Um, and of course, it's related to this word, which is disorder. So this is the uncertainty you have uh, in knowing precisely uh, what energy levels the molecules are occupying um, to measure the disorder. And um, and the more disorder you have, or the more energy levels, the more possibilities there, then the I, the W, and the I, the entropy. So uh, this is this idea that I values of entropy are related to uh, high values of disorder. So that's that sort of the microscopic view. I'm just mentioning the passing. Uh, well, I will say one thing. Uh, we have this absolute zero. Uh, t is, t is um, uh, we'll see that the third law of thermodynamics says you can't reach this. Uh, um, but, um, well, certain types of processes prevent a barrier. To, uh, absolute zero prevents a barrier. To reach an absolute zero, uh, but as we go towards absolute zero, then uh, what happens, of course, the W decreases. Um, now, uh, depends what happens at absolute zero, but uh, it's possible that there's only one possible uh, way you can organise uh, the energy levels have all come down. Uh, the, the particles can only occupy possibly one arrangement, and in that case. Um, you might have, uh, and this is, comes from another theory, this has come from quantum theory, you know, um, uh, but there's something called a ground ground state, uh, and if it's non-degenerate, you will have just W, uh, W takes up the value of one, uh, where you know absolutely uh, what, um, uh, uh, there's no disorder whatsoever, it's totally ordered, everything is everything's defined. So, uh, so as so at absolute zero, zero then. Uh, so at, can t uh, w can be can with certain provisors um, can be equal to one, and we find that s is equal to the k natural log of one, which is equal to zero. Uh, and of course, in our units, well, let's have it as joules per kelvin, since we're using K as that. So zero joule per kelvin. So, uh, and there's a third, the third law is also related to the fact that our entropy behaves as you go towards absolute zero. And it's to do with what happens um, uh, to the to the, all these various states, uh, energy states that the molecules can occupy. Again, this is microscopic, microscopic. it's not classical thermodynamics. It's coming from uh, the microscopic world. But uh, well, this simple formula then uh, does exist for entropy. Um, um, although working the W out uh, can be, is quite a challenge. 
uh, combinatorics uh, is sort of the field where you have to where that involves to work these things out uh, in statistical mechanics. Uh, so we're not going to do anything about it, uh, but there is this definition, uh, and there is um, it is associated with this disorder, uh, the way the number of energy levels that uh, can be occupied by particles or mo molecules, um, and um, and as the temperature comes down. Uh, so generally, what we find is as temperature comes down, entropy drops, uh, which is, and as temperature goes up, uh, entropy increases. This is something that we see, um, and we're going to find, we will find that entropy is a, a, a property of our system, and we'll get to that. We're going to define it first using reversibility. The other, the other word then, so that's, so we've quality, we've done um, quality of energy, um, which is just an, it's just a, it's just a, a soft word to try to introduce uh, entropy has no real significance disorder has real meaning uh, it's coming from the microscope microscopic world a spontaneous uh, so spontaneous changes we tend to view these as natural changes uh, so a spontaneous change uh, change uh, is a change that takes place uh, without uh, without being driven, I suppose, being driven uh, driven uh, by work. So lots of processes, lots of processes. Uh, we'll find um, we we have to drive them. We need work to do to to, uh, uh, to get things to to do things more often than not. Uh, but some processes will take place without work. So we're going to uh, get on to the uh, refrigeration, for instance. Um, uh, to do refrigeration, you need work. Uh, and uh, if you didn't plug your refrigerator in uh, at the socket, it certainly wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't be working. Wouldn't be cooling down your uh, your food by itself. Work has to energy has to be supplied there uh, in the form of work. Uh, there's a motor there, the pump, uh, driving things round uh, in that process. Uh, so that is certainly not a spontaneous change. Uh, we have seen some spontaneous change uh, on, uh, when we looked at the zero flow. Uh, that was a spontaneous change where we had a high temperature and a low temperature. And energy, um, heat essentially, uh, was flowing from the high to the low. And that is a natural, we would naturally think of that as natural. That's a spontaneous change. We don't need work, it's, it's occurring uh, all by itself. Uh, so, that is, um, so that is most definitely uh, a spontaneous uh, process. So there's lots of processes like that. Uh, usually, when you've got um, gradients, also in, uh, I suppose, concentration gradients. Uh, what nature tends to want to do, it tends to want to annihilate gradients. This seems to be, uh, you know, if, if you've got a, a process where you've got two temperatures, for instance, high and the low, nature will want to balance that. It'll want to, it want heat to flow out, uh, and it'll want to bring the te the temperature gradient down. So, quite often, lots of things where you see gradients in, uh, in um, uh, uh, pressure gradients, uh, concentration gradients, anything like that you'll find that uh, spontaneous processes are taking place uh, that most processes we do um, to enact things, we have to drive them from work. So uh, spontaneous then, we tend to think about this as sort of natural processes uh, that we see. And in fact, we're gonna, we kind of use these. So we're gonna get onto this with our heat engines. Uh, we are in fact using the, the uh, spontaneous processes to produce work. Uh, this is what we're going to find. We're going to use uh, heat, um, heat engines. We get onto that, and which drive, uh, which uh, are essentially driven by natural processes, essentially driven by the by the second law of thermodynamics, as it turns out. Uh, we uh, we'll see that the second law is uh, is the is the governing governing law as far as the, the type of process that we see uh, being possible. So that's spontaneous. Uh, now, reversibility then. Uh, so I've mentioned reversibility, uh, systems that can be reversed, really. Um, 
uh, and usually by an infinitesimal change. Uh, so a small change in one of the properties, uh, and if, it, if the system is able to go reverse itself, um, uh, then um, then we that we would call that a reversible process. As I say, they, they tend not to exist. They tend to be idealized processes, uh, but we can use them nonetheless uh, because they do tell us about uh, the efficiencies of things. Uh, what's the best machines, for instance? Uh, what's the maximum working out of things? We're going to find that uh, they provide these limits. Um, um, so reversibility, um, and what we find with reversibility, um, we can introduce the entropy and whilst we've got an equation for entropy here, there's another equation which is this one. Uh, so reversibility uh, a system, well let's just roughly say this is a, uh, a system that can be reversed reversed by an infinitesimal an infinitesimal change um, in some property usually in the surroundings in uh, the surroundings this is usually been a bit more precise so if we make a, a slight change and, the, and the, uh, it reverses, then we can say it's reversible. So that's what reversibility means. Uh, when we've got reversibility, as I say, it doesn't exist in practice. Uh, from this, we're going to find, we're going to define, uh, again, ds is equal to delta q, uh, where I'm going to put a little, well, let's put a little r, r reversible t. Uh, we're going to find another formula uh, a bit later on, I'm just introducing it at the moment, I'm going to mention this, uh, where heat is supplied reversibly. Uh, for heat is supplied reversibly, there's got to be no temperature gradient, so usually that's a problem, but a very tiny gradient, a potentially small gradient, uh, can supply heat. Uh, and uh, we're going to find that the, the change in entropy, this is a property, uh, uh, heat transfer, of course, is not... Uh, temperature is, uh, but we're going to we're going to uh, get on to this uh, uh, a little bit later on. So this is sort of just a, what I'm doing, just a, sort of a brief introduction to where we're going. Um, uh, we're going to go, and now I'm going to attack the, uh, the second law. We're going to look at practical definitions of the second law before we get on to the proper definition of entropy, uh, where we're going to be looking at reversibility. Of systems, and we're going to find, uh, as uh, might as well just say it now, we're going to find that what it means to be reversible, uh, and particularly we're interested in cyclic processes. What it means to be reversible is that you don't produce entropy. We're going to see that entropy can be produced. Entropy is not going to be a conserved thing, uh, unlike energy. Uh, uh, during our natural process, uh, I think one minus one manifestation of the uh, second law of thermodynamics is that the system plus the surroundings uh, during a spontaneous process, uh, the entropy will increase. Uh, so it's not convert. So at the universe, then, uh, the entropy will definitely increase uh, due, during all the process that we're seeing uh, going on. So uh, if you take the view that uh, high entropy is low quality, uh, then that, uh, in some respects, that's a little bit worrying, yes. Uh, um, and we'll talk, we'll see, there's some nuances there, and we'll talk about that as, as we get into it. Um, so that's that's uh, essentially a brief introduction uh, to what I want to do. Um, so let us start um, uh, looking at heat engines, shall we? So uh, heat engines is a subject in its own right, which is interesting. So... Uh, not just to get to the uh, definition of entropy, which we will do um, uh, with reversible heat engines. These are sort of fictitious devices which you can ride, drive them in either direction. Um, uh, but um, uh, but they are interesting in their own right because uh, uh, you know uh, we use the, 
uh, heat engines to 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 produce work, of course, um, and, um, and power stations and all the rest of it. Uh, we also use uh, reversed engines to uh, for refrigeration, also heat pumps. Heat pumps have become quite popular uh, for heating one's home. They're suggesting that we should uh, be using these things, and we could look at them and see why why they might be suggesting that. Uh, so. So heat engines is, is quite a, it's quite an interesting subject in its own right, I think, uh, from, a, really from an engineering point of view. Uh, so what if I'm going to look at uh, anyway is even if I didn't agree <laughs> with using reversibility to uh, get to entropy. Uh, <coughs> because the reason I mentioned this I, and, I, and why I've always wanted to give the microscopic view is to do with the fact that... Um, um, when you when you introduce temperature, for instance, with the zeroth law, uh, it doesn't tell you anything about it really. It's uh, okay. It gives you um, it gives you sort of a macroscopic definition. It doesn't give sort of insight into what it is. Um, and similarly for energy, yes, uh, we can define it using our classical thermodynamics. And thermodynamics is fantastic for this. All these bits are fitting together to make a fantastic self-contained subject. It's using observational uh, experiments, uh, and we are again using. It's going to be observational experiments that we're going to in introduce entropy via reversibility. Um, it doesn't it doesn't depend on reversibility. We're, we're, uh, it's, it's it is an observational second law. We make the second law. Um, uh, it's, it's it's an experimental uh, version that we've got two of them. In fact, that I'm going to introduce. Uh, there's lots of different versions. Um, so, but it's, it's, it's useful, I find, just to understand a little bit about um, the microscopic as well, because it just gives you a fuller picture. And as I say, when it comes to entropy, the microscopic view is, uh, uh, it's, it's quite straightforward, as it turns out. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't that complicated, we'll see. Uh, yet the, the engineering view uh, can be a little bit obscure. And I'm both, I think it's a very powerful, powerful tool, even though, as I say, we don't need this for, for our, our subject. So what is a heat engine? What's a heat engine? Uh, it looks like this. Let me just draw, draw it. It's, we're going to have a temperature, a reservoir. I'm going to call that T1. This is our, I'll just write that's a hot reservoir. Reservoir. So hot reservoir. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Uh, we have um, and uh, and from that we're going to have uh, something like this. It's an engine. Um, I'm going to have a cold reservoir. So cold reservoir. We're a cold reservoir um, and. And we're going to have work, shaft work, generally, WS. We're going to have heat coming from the hot. We're going to have heat supplied to the cold. Uh, and we're going to have, what we can imagine is, uh, something, I'm going to put a little arrow around this. This is something going around a cycle, a fluid which is going around a cycle. Um, so what is the hot and cold reservoirs? Well, a reservoir, you can imagine a reservoir as something, it doesn't change in temperature. Uh, so one way to think about it is to uh, imagine it as a well having a, a high uh, specific heat capacity, for instance. If you have a very high, that would that would stop any temperature change. So one, so it's a it's a reservoir, if you like, and you can take heat out of it, and it doesn't it doesn't have an effect. It's so big, if you see what I mean. It's a massive energy store. Uh, or alternatively, we might be supplying the heat into that, and we'll mention that a little bit later on. But essentially, it's it's just a constant temperature. Uh, energy can be dr drawn from it, uh, and it's been supplied to something, that, some kind of engine that's going around a, a cycle. Uh, so heat engines have certain things in common. What are the things that are in common? First of all, they've got two reservoirs, a cold and a hot. Um, uh, temperature, so heat is being drawn from uh, the hot reservoir, work is being produced, um, and 
it, it has been rejected uh, to the core reservoir. So this is what a, 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 a heat engine looks like. You can also, this is um, some, a direct engine, we could sort of call it that. Uh, we have direct engine, or oh, heat engine, I suppose, heat engine. But also we have reversed, reversed heat engine. So the reversed one, same thing really, T1, uh, uh, and in this case, we're gonna do put work into the thing. So we'll do shaft work into the thing. Heat is gonna flow in the other direction um, from the coal reservoir. So this T, T, this is again our coal reservoir, our hot reservoir, this is T1. Um, and uh, this is going to be Q1, and this is our Q2. Uh, and again, this thing is going around a cycle. Let's, let's uh, move, move it around the other way. So a fluid, uh, as in, we imagine a, a fluid of some form going around a cycle, uh, and from which uh, we can, uh, in this case, produce work. Uh, and uh, here we're doing work, but we're, what we're interested in is draw and eat maybe from the coal reservoir, that would be a refrigeration process, um, or, or supplying heat uh, to the inside of a house, that would be a heat pump, wasn't it, where you're interested in, uh, you've got a cold outside, uh, you're drawing energy from the outside environment, uh, and you're supplying it to the house, um, heating up the uh, room or something like that, or a building. Uh, and this is a, a reversed, Uh, heat engine. So there are sort of two uh, possibilities, um, which we've, uh, which uh, which uh, we're interested in. Um, okay, so what? Uh, well, let's have a look at some. Let's have just have a look at a, a practical design of this thing, since this is this is. Uh, uh, at the moment of it, um, uh, we can actually think of very practical ways of building these things. Uh, so let's have a look at the uh, that, that particular one. Uh, so let's imagine, the, so let me draw a possible series of things that could produce this. Uh, so let's have a look at, a, I'm going to call it, this is a boiler. Let's have a boiler. In the boiler, I'm going to supply energy. Q1. Um, through so this this let's imagine there's some pipe work coming through this thing. Let's do a bit wiggly like that. Comes out. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the boil in a second. Uh, but usually it's a combustion process going on there, uh, which I, I'm I'm a, it's a supplying the heat. But essentially, uh, heat is. Uh, remember when we look at the heat exchange, I split into two halves. Uh, and the boiler is essentially a heat exchanger, um, and uh, but usually you've got a combustion process or raising the temperature of something uh, supplies energy. And I'm just looking at the energy being supplied there from this. Um, okay, so let's have a look at um, uh, what we want to look at is um, a turbine. So we've got a turbine. Um, so let's call that T, um, and let's have some work out of that. So let's call that W, uh, WT. So for the turbines producing work, uh, this then, the output from the turbine, so we're going, the fluid's coming through here. Fluid's coming in, heated up, um, hot, hot material is produced to the turbine, an expansion process takes place, it exits here, and goes to... Well, let's put it through another another um, another heat exchanger, which is a condenser. Um, so this is my um, uh, so this is the um, let's, um, let's call it a condenser then condenser. And from that, we'll mention a little bit more about that again. Let's put a little squiggly line there. It's indicating, and here heat has been, um, it has been rejected. 
uh, uh, this is our Q2, I suppose. He has been rejected. Uh, usually, there's going to be another system here that I've not put on, uh, which would be a cooling system, so cooling water. Uh, we take the heat away. Uh, again, I'm only using, so this is a heat exchanger. I'm just given half the heat exchanger. I, I, I don't really care about the other system. Uh, uh, then we're going to have a pump, I think. Uh, we're going to have a pump, let's call it P, um, and I'm going to, I've got um, work uh, for the pump. pump. And uh, so the fluid then moves off and joins up here. Uh, so this is this is uh, essentially a process by which uh, we can get out work. It's a power in a uh, so it could be steam. It could be a steam power plant, for instance. Uh, so what we could have uh, hot steam here coming into the turbine. So heated up by uh, by the boiler, so some combustion process, uh, coal or gas, whatever processes, uh, whatever uh, combustion process has been done there uh, and we find uh, from the from the turbine uh, turbines are there for producing work we had a look at these uh, when we looked at open systems uh, so shaft work comes out that a lot of work um, and then uh, out out of the turbine uh, comes lower energy uh, probably still vapor not just uh, it could reach liquid generally not usually for the turbines you tend to keep it uh, just to do with the fact practicalities of turbines that like you don't want to damage the blades uh, with with vapor with uh, with um, particles of water. Um, so usually, anyway, as you get low, and it, uh, what's going to happen? The condenser then it cools it down and it will change it back to liquid. The pump then uh, feeds this liquid water back into the boiler, heats it up, turns it back to steam, feeds it round, and we've got a cycle here. Uh, combined, we can see that we've got energy going in there. Now, from here, it's a combustion, so it's a hot temperature, it's fixed, and that would be our T1. Uh, so even though it's not the sort of conventional reservoir, this is a simplification, of course, uh, but of course, it's a fixed temperature, there's a temperature there by which the energy has been supplied using that comb combustion process. Uh, changing this, um, changing our... Uh, our uh, liquid to steam, yeah, taking uh, water to steam, uh, superheated steam. That's more certainly what we want when we when we come into the uh, when we come into the uh, the turbine, practically. So that's our Q1. There we go. This is what's happening, and um, uh, work is produced. Uh, low energy goes into condenser. Energy's coming out. Q2. Then this is it. Q2. Uh, it's it's as I said. There'll be a cooling system here. Uh, but if you notice, the what I'm focusing on with this is just heat transfers. I'm not working on mass transfers. No mass transfers in this. Uh, all the mass transfers. Um, but to get this thing to work, I've, I've neglected them. Uh, clearly, there's a, a cooling system. There's mass transfer there, but I've ignored it and just focused on the energy transfer. Uh, so um, we've got work transfer. There's going to be a network because, OK, we have to do work here. But this is the feeder pump, really. This is just driving the material around. Um, uh, so this is a small amount. So the network out the WS is WT minus W pump here. Uh, so, the, so the net shaft, this is just, I've only got one shaft here, but we've got two here. But this is quite small compared to this. The turbine will produce, you know, for a power system, this is going to drive the, the you know, electricity, some generator, you know, it's a high energy. Uh, here, this is just a feeder, um, so lower energy, uh, just to drive the uh, fluid around, fluid around the system there. Um, so that's a practical system. That's a that's a direct heat engine, <laughs> uh, and a practical one at that. Um, what, so what about the uh, reversed heat engine? Um, well, refrigeration, of course, refrigeration. Um, that's uh, that's what we'd like to do. Uh, so what, what we imagine there, we imagine, uh, well, let me draw this one then. So let's draw an ice box in your fridge. Um, and we're going to feed, uh, we're going to feed into that 
Uh, well, I'm going to feed. Let's come. Let's come. Let's come round here and back, and then we're going to go into this thing. Let's come back out of it um, and down. Um, uh, we're going to have. Well, we're going to drive it round. So what I want is a. I want a pump. Let's have a pump here. Yeah. Let's have a pump, which is. Um, and we're going to do some uh, work for the pump. Uh, driving. Uh, well, that's not so good. Let's draw that. Uh, okay, let's draw that again. So into the pump, out of the pump, uh, into a condenser. Uh, so here's another condenser. Can I call? It, well, let's put a squiggly string in there. So this is. Can I call this C? This is my condenser. This is my pump. Uh, and out of there, we're going to go uh, to a device, which is the throttle, the valve. So let me draw that again. There we go. So what we're going to do, we're going to, this is our refrigerator. Uh, that's our condenser. Um, so energy uh, is being supplied, we we'll call that Q2, shall we? Energy has been supplied uh, from the ice box. You uh, you want to cool down what's in the ice box, yes, uh, in your fridge. Uh, so energy uh, must be blown from the ice box to the to the refrigerant, which must have a colder temperature there for for that to happen. How does it achieve it? Well, how does it achieve it? The pump just just drives the thing round, of course. Um, and what we're going to find then. Um, so as we, as we come into this part of the ice box, um, it's it's going to be a vapor. Um, uh, so oh well, before I do that, we obviously we're going to give off uh, Q1 here, aren't we? This is our our Q1 uh, into into uh, into into that uh, into that system. Uh, well, it's going to change a bit. So what we've got. So the condenser, of course, changes. Uh, if you go around this cycle, the condenser cools, um, cools the uh, um, the refrigerant that's in there. So the refrigerant flowing around this thing. Um, it it uh, comes in as a liquid as it as it as it comes into the throttle valve. Remember what the throttle valve was doing. The throttle valve was giving us a large pressure drop. It was an ice and alpic process, and the effect of it was to uh, the right material it was to have a temperature drop so as we go across uh, the throttle valve the temperature will drop uh, so you always find throttle valves in refrigeration units or heat pumps essentially the heat pump and refrigeration are the same thing really uh, so the temperature of this is quite cold uh, what happens of course uh, is is that as the heat uh, flows out the out your ice box it uh, changes this back to a vapor so the pump is actually pumping a vapor back into the condenser. Condenser is a heat, ex heat exchanger for for cooling down. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the, um, the, uh, the refrigerant, and uh, we just go around this particular cycle. So this is a refrigeration uh, cycle. Uh, which is this basically? Uh, we're having to do work uh, for this, and the shaft work here, the pump is what's doing the work. So this is what's driving your in your fridge at home. You've got an electric motor; it's driving the pump. Uh, the pump is pumping round a cycle, a refrigerant, uh, which has certain it's it work it's certain properties that we're interested in that works at uh, very much at room temperature and below room temperature as so, well. A particular type of refrigerant to do that, um, and uh, we find that uh, uh, we can lower the temperature of the, uh, the refrigerant by means of the throttle valve, so that uh, essentially the heats up again. Um, uh, you put work into the system, um, and uh, the temperature rises and. Uh, we have to cool it down. Uh, the temperature here, of course, is usually at the back of the the the, uh, 
the condenser unit is usually at the back of the fridge. It's a bit, it's, uh, it's warm when you put your hands there and it's releasing energy into the, into the room. Uh, uh, so that, that's the, so this is a, just a practical, uh, uh, a practical cycle of, of what we mean by heat engine. Uh, so generally, I don't, uh, all these bits of equipment that I've got there, I don't worry too much about. But when I'm talking about going on a cycle, of course, with my heat engine here, what I'm thinking about is that we've got this, there's some device there that's uh, producing all these uh, uh, the heat transfers and the uh, and work transfers, uh, some kind of uh, mechanism there. Uh, as I say, what we can see essentially is um, it's a cycle. The, this refrigerant here is going on a cycle. It's the same refrigerant here. Steam, water, uh, uh, H2O is going around a cycle. Uh, it's the same um, H2O that's being used. Uh, so that's what we imagine. We have a continuous cycle uh, where heat is being put into this thing, heat is being rejected, and we do work. And so this is a uh, a given device. Um, so now we're doing for time. Okay, we slightly run out of time. Uh, so that's essentially uh, just a, a brief introduction uh, to um, heat engines. We're going to study these in a bit more detail in our next lecture. Um, um, but all, all I've really done is sort of introduced the idea we're going to get to the second law. It's going to talk about entropy. Uh, we're going to get to it. Uh, by means of heat engines, we're going to look at these very special heat engines that reverse, uh, uh, that you can reverse them. Um, um, not necessarily reversed, uh, this is uh, where we've got reversibility. Uh, you can drive them in both directions. Uh, these are going to turn out to be very efficient uh, heat engines indeed. Uh, and we're going to, this route will, will get to the uh, idea of defining entropy in the macroscopic sense um, rather than the microscopic sense. Um, but th th this set of lectures are really just focusing on the heat engines because they're, they're interested in their own right. Uh, we're going to look at the efficiency of them. We're going to look at the temperature scale. Uh, that's good. We can define the temperature scale again using reversible heat engines. Uh, it turns out that the efficiency of a reversible heat engine does not depend on the substance that you're using. Here I'm using steam. Uh, it turns out for this very special type of heat engine where, where you can reverse it, um, we're going to find that uh, the substance doesn't matter and therefore it only depends on the temperatures and consequently it turns out therefore you can, uh, you can define a scale uh, which uh, Lord Kelvin uh, managed to do. Um, so uh, with that I'll say goodbye and I'll, I'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.